Good morning and welcome to Place Tech Talks offices. My name is Dan Hughes from Alpha Property Insight, which helps property companies navigate digital transformation. And a huge thank you to our sponsors for this session, Malcolm and Dreesen Summer. Not a day goes by at the moment without a story about the future of the office, which often seem contradictory. The CEO of Goldman Sachs claimed that remote working is not a new normal, it's an aberration that we're going to correct as soon as possible. And this statement was closely followed by Twitter CEO announcing that Twitter employees can now work for, from home forever. At one extreme, the advantages of working from home are clear. Less commuting time, more flexibility, less impact on the environment, at least by some measures. And all of this against the backdrop of many companies having seen no downturn in productivity during lockdown. But what about those without enough space or the environment to work from home? How do we maintain relationships where human interaction is so important? especially in meeting new people, negotiating, being creative? And how do we establish and maintain culture of an organisation remotely? In comparison to the earlier examples, perhaps a more balanced approach is that of Deloitte, who recently said that they're going to let their staff choose where they need to be to do their best work, in balance with their professional and personal responsibilities. And that the offices will principally be used for team collaboration, training and client meetings. It seems likely that the future work will be a balance of these different approaches, trying to get the benefits of each with different companies leaning one way or the other. But whatever the answer, the office of the future will evolve. And at the heart of this will be how the office works for people using them and technology has a key role to play in measuring and facilitating all of this change. Today, we've got two fantastic panels to discuss all of this and more with a 10 minute networking break in between. Please do submit your questions in the Q&A session and I'll try and introduce them into the conversation as we go. Um, so let's crack on. If I could ask the panelists to join me on the virtual stage, I'm delighted to be joined by Alison English, Deputy CEO of Leesman, Simon Schaefer, Founder and CEO of Factory, James Pellet, Director of Workplace and Innovation at Great Portland Estates, and James Rankin, Head of Research and Insights at the Instant Group. So good morning to all of you. Thank you very much for joining. Alison, perhaps I could start with you. Could you just say a few words about yourself to introduce yourself and your organization? Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. And hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Alison English, as Dan said, Deputy CEO here at Leesman. Um, Leesman is an organization that measures employee experience in the workplace. Uh, that for the last 11 years has historically focused on um, the office. But as we all know, last year, lots of things changed and we started measuring what employee experience looks like um, when people are working from home. And basically, we're trying to understand what does the environment do to an employee? How does it impact on them? Um, we have the world's largest global database um, of of employee experience in the workplace. So again, looking at that from the home perspective and the office perspective, um, and we benchmark all of our clients' data back to that so we can understand kind of what does average look like um, and what does good look like. So that's a little bit about Leesman. Um, and yeah, looking forward to speaking to the rest of the panelists um, about this. So thanks, Dan. Perfect, thank you, Alison. Uh, James Pellet, perhaps I could come to you next with the same question. Hi, uh, I'm James Pellet. I'm Director of Workplace and Innovation at Great Portland Estates. We're a FTSE 250 uh, real estate investment trust with a specific focus on London. Uh, we develop mostly commercial real estate mo and 70% uh, of our portfolio is uh, offices. Uh, the rest is retail with a tiny bit of residential. Um, and my role is to look at uh, workplace trends and technology and try and bring them both together to shape our product to stay ahead of occupier need. Um, so quite a challenging uh, and interesting time for me and uh, looking forward to discussing more with the rest of the panel. Fantastic, I'm sure you've had a quiet 18 months. Um, James Rankin, maybe I can come to you next, please. Sure, uh, I'm James Rankin, so I head up research and insight at the Instant Group. Um, the Instant Group are a workspace, a flexible workspace specialist company. So we focus on helping clients, both SMEs, but also increasingly corporates, large corporates, move into sort of more flexible and agile workspace. Um, alongside that, we support the um, operators, we call them or our partners, in providing flexible workspace um, and increasingly working with landlords to give them visibility on, on what's happening in this market and, and how they can enter. Fantastic, James. Thank you very much. And Simon, last but not least, same question to you, please. Good morning. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> thanks for having me. Uh, Simon Schaefer, founder of Factory.com. 
Um, we are a office play, if you want, for technology companies first and startups, but mostly um, trying to get um, different kinds of creative industries into one place and help facilitate synergies between them. Um, and I'm also advising the Portuguese government on startup policy as well as the European Commission with DG Connect. And I'm very happy to be here today and looking forward to the discussion. Brilliant. Thanks, Simon. Simon, perhaps I could stay with you, but we've already alluded to it. It's unavoidable to talk about the impact that COVID has had on the use of offices and office space. Can you just say a few words about how you think it's changed it where we are today, but also the longer term changes that you think that'll be driving? Oh, wow. Yeah, sure. Um, from my perspective, we've always worked for technology companies. And um, when you look at the sort of corporate culture and the, the um, urge to hire and, and, and keep the best talent that you can possibly can, um, it's sometimes in a fierce fight for talent. Um, in Berlin, where I was um, for the better part of my career, even now here in Lisbon, the fight for talent in the um, development arena is, is quite fierce and intense and it feels like there has always been that tendency of the technology companies to give a bit more flexibility on where people can work and how people can work and it feels like COVID has just been enormous turbo when it comes to that and actually accelerating this trend across everything that I see right now. Um, I do believe that if you look operationally on the actual asset and on the floor plans and how it actually impacts office design, from my perspective, working for clients such as Daimler Real Estate or having worked for Twitter, Mozilla, Uber, and others like this, um, I do think that the fixed desk is dead. So really sort of having a fixed position inside your office is no longer really required. And in order to accommodate that, you will need technology to manage how people enter, exit, and where they stay, and when they stay at the office. So from our perspective, that's that's our big, big thing to tackle. Um, how can we make sure people can actually have the best experience and not in half-empty office at all times? Yeah, very good. James Pellet, how do you feel about that? How do you see it from your point of view, from a landlord's point of view, but both the short-term and, and also the longer-term impact? Um, I think that there's no doubt there has been a massive impact. Um, it's made people question the office, if nothing else. It was uh, heading that way before um, the pandemic hit. You know, the last CBRE Occupy survey uh, saw, you know, the number one benefit of the office was to attract and retain staff. So it was seen as a means of, uh, in, in an area of full employment, as a, as a, as a key attractor. Uh, I don't think that's gone away. I just think that what goes into it is very different. I, I, I fully agree with Simon that technology uh, has accelerated as a result of, you know, people's use of technology has accelerated. So people are much more open-minded to the deployment of air quality sensors in their workspace than they ever were before. It was, it was there were big concerns about uh, data privacy before, which seemed to have uh, fallen down the scale slightly, but unsurprisingly, maybe. Um, and I think we're in for a very, very interesting couple of years as we all learn and get to grips with what works for us and what doesn't work for us. Because uh, certainly in the UK, I think the impact of um, working from home has almost been universal. So a lot of the time, everyone's been working from home. Uh, and we've kept our offices open all the way through lockdown. We've The lowest point, we were about 10% utilisation. But generally speaking, we're now seeing that come up and up and up. And as we uh, enter this period of um, being a giant Petri dish, it seems, uh, you know, that every everything gets open in a couple of weeks time. Um, we expect to see more of that, but we expect to have to work with our occupiers much more than we, we always did, but even more than we did before to help them with that return and that flexibility and understanding what goes on in our spaces. OK, great. Thank you. James uh, Rankin, what, what are your views on that, especially with the role of flex space within that? Yeah, I mean, one thing that we've seen is is obviously even in the flexible industry, and particularly initially, there was a big kind of hit as, as COVID happened. But actually, our data is showing that demand now is far exceeding where it was pre, pre pandemic. So it's really kind of sped up, I think, people's um, awareness of what of what flexible brings and their, I guess, willingness to explore it. Um, I'd mirror what some of the previous comments have been, which is I think the trends that we're seeing now have really just sped up. Um, they were already there, but it was just a slower adoption. 
um, the majority of sort of the large corporates that we're working with are kind of talking about this test and learn phase where I don't think anyone really knows what the, the ideal solution is going to be. Um, so everyone's looking at what's the, um, the best and most affordable way of testing different solutions across their business to find out which one works best for their team. Um, and I think that's one you know area where obviously the flexible industry is able to support. Um, but the big thing I think you know that we've seen is is occupiers are now sort of asking questions more from their landlords or from their office space provider, both in terms of um, you know feedback but also input into the space. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to come back to uh, a couple of points that were made. James, tell us about the culture aspect and James about the testing of stuff, because I think those two go together. But Alison, if I could come to you first, just from an occupier point of view, with, with two questions, really. One is, how do you see the needs of being changed through COVID and longer term in the offices? And then perhaps a follow up question. There seems to be, if you read the press, a bit of a disconnect between senior management and the people who actually are in the offices and i just wondered if you had any view on on those sort of that that tension on your first point i think what what james mentioned earlier about defining the purpose of the workplace some of the organizations we work with particularly the ones we worked with for a while i, I would say are, are a bit more um in tune with that because this is something they they've been discussing but actually needing to articulate and understand what people are going to use the space for is a relatively new phenomenon for a lot of organizations. It, it before was, it was something that was a bit taken for granted and it was a given. It was, you need an office, so you need desks and you need chairs and you kind of need places for people to sit. As, as Simon said, you know, that fixed desk where you would come in, do your work and then leave. Um, this has opened up uh, again now for more and more organizations, kind of a, a, a shift in that mentality. Um, so we're hearing that in the conversations we're having with our clients, um, but again, also also seeing that in in some of the data and what people what people want. Um, to your second point, I think there there is a disconnect in I think the those business leaders who who have that disconnect are hearing it, um, particularly from the backlash. You know, when they're saying, "Okay, we're going to offer flexibility," but that means you come in Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, or something, something like that. I think um, what Apple said a, a few days ago, um, along something along those lines. So there, there does seem to be a disconnect with some of those organiza organizations with what leadership is saying um, and what what the people working for those organizations actually want. Um, but then you have you have on on kind of the other extreme, one of our clients, um, Standard Chartered Bank, who has. They, they've started talking about flexibility from day one. They've, they've taken out um, a large number of flexible um, flexible spaces. So they're, they're offering employees choice. Um, their CEO, Bill Winters has said, my office is a bookable meeting room. Um, so it's, it, that is, I think, an example on the other end of how organizations are, um, if, if leadership is embracing that flexibility and that mentality um, and they're offering that to employees and kind of living and breathing that, then I think you see that um, and feel that in the organization with, rather than the ones who are just just kind of talking and then later not not recognizing that there is that disconnect. Yeah, that's great. Simon, maybe I could come to you and pick specifically on the tech companies which you mentioned that you started off working for. Tech companies seem to be the ones that are often seen as being more flexible, more open to home working and so on, but that isn't always the case. So I just wanted to, to get your view on on the, the flexible working, the disconnect, but also the difference between different sectors. So the tech sector from your point of view versus perhaps the more corporate side of things. So I used the examples in earlier of, of Goldman Sachs and, and Twitter, which are pretty pretty much the two opposite organizations I suspect in many ways. Yeah, and the leadership of Twitter, I mean, he's also um, running Square, I believe. So it's a quite, quite forward thinking gentleman there. Um, well, if, if I look at the first reactions when COVID first took place and what the tech companies were announcing then, I think Facebook was one of them saying, we need to now be in every major city where there's, where there's talent. Um, and I believe that that is ultimately the driver. Um, and I think that's one of the things that the tech community has always been really good with, to kind of understand bottom-up trends and follow it through. Um, I would argue another impact that I see now when we talk about corporate innovation um, units, such as the one we're dealing here with in Lisbon from Daimler Benz, they asked us from all of what, you, what you've seen from tech companies, what is the main interior design feature, office feature that you think remains and sort of is relevant? 
and it's the all hands area right so an area where there's sort of uh, uh, the possibility to update the entire company and you have to do that regularly and that's what your staff expects and that's again kind of a bottom-up principle management has to justify also to the employees what they've been doing and i think if that is the silver lining there then um, I think we we have to watch what the tech companies are doing and sort of understand what's happening in two years' time for the general commercial real estate of the sector. That was great. Uh, James Rankin, what are your views on that? And also, do you see the difference between different sectors, different company sizes, and, and how they're approaching things? Um, yeah, I mean, traditionally, the, you know, the smaller companies have been a lot more nimble um, and therefore are able to react quicker. Um, and that's both a positive and a negative, um, depending on the circumstances. I think the one thing that, you know, one of the things that we're certainly seeing is it really depends on what, uh, who's involved in that decision making process. Um, as we're increasingly seeing sort of real estate teams be not necessarily merged but involved with HR teams and IT teams. Um, to sort of form working groups, then you start to get different conversations. Um, and what we're seeing is companies try and define what they want from their office space. So if you, you know, that you've, you called out earlier, I think the main reason that they came out with that statement is because they wanted to enforce the workplace culture that they office space lost. Um, individuals working from home. So I think if, if you can determine what the priority is, in terms of the overall um, driver, then you can start to look at your workspace and understand what needs to be in place to help drive those behaviours or, or that priority. Um, but it, I think it, it, you know, it really depends on if the company's willing to go out, talk to their employees, understand the differences and, and sort of cater to those. There are going to be challenges um, and we're seeing that as companies try and make change because ultimately different employees different um, demographics different age groups want different things um, and that's quite challenging particularly i think you know where we are today um, there are technologies that exist to help but i would say they need further improvement you know on demand scheduling things like that are still relatively um, in their infancy um, so i think as, as technology develops we'll start to see um, better solutions come out but there's going, there's, going to, there's going to be challenges, you know, for the, I'd say, foreseeable future as companies try and work through the different um, elements that their employees want. And everyone is different, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. So, James Pellet, from a, from a landlord's point of view, how on earth do you build the offices of the future for everyone when everyone wants something different? How do you build in that sort of approach? Uh, by doing your research, by um, taking a real step back about what it is that people want from spaces. Um, Pre-pandemic, we've, it's why it's why working with Alison and actually with, with Instant Group as well, just looking at the research and the data and, and really trying to understand Occupy's needs. Because they, whilst it's generic, you can boil it down to several key factors, which is flexibility, uh, a choice of where to sit throughout the day, so as long as you can give any occupier a, a, something that isn't entirely rigid, but within some bounds of rules, some space to work outside, for example, as well as to work inside. It's why most of our buildings have now amazing uh, uh, facilities on the ground floor as well as in the rest of the building and great coffee. Uh, Addison's number one uh, thing that's a common factor in um, any, any survey that you've read from Leesman is having great facilities within the building. And so we, we make sure that we provide all those things in our buildings so that I think any, any organization at the moment is faced with uncertainty and they don't know what's happening and that, that causes a great deal of stress. So what we, we're saying to them, whether they're coming to one of our flex spaces or they're coming to our headquarters is, we will give you feedback and we will work with you to help you optimize that experience be it in terms of uh, workspace density, but also in, very importantly, in terms of energy consumption and sustainability, we're enabling our spaces to make that happen. And that is proving very popular. We, we launched a, um, a flexible workspace in Soho in February this year. It's fully let. It backs up what James is saying about demand for flex space. Uh, it is a one-stop shop, simple cost. You know what you're paying for. And demand there is extremely high, and um, and we're achieving 
very good rents as a result of that. So it's um, you just you, you you I think you you can't say here's an answer, but you can say here is a solution by which we're going to work with you, and that's really what we're trying to do. Okay, that's great. So we just had a question that's come in, which I think is um, it's a good time to slot it in about uh, lighting, the impact of lighting, biophilia, well-being of staff, the impacts of those. Um, so firstly, your thoughts on those, how important they are, and Alison, maybe I can come to you. And then secondly, how practical are they to actually implement? In, in terms of what our data says, um, definitely, definitely important. Um, lighting, air quality, biophilia, all of those things, it, those have been talked about long before COVID. I think we're, we're much more aware of, of things, as James was saying earlier, like air quality and people are, are um, I think, recognizing the importance of that more, given the research that was done on how the virus has spread in, in certain areas, particularly in closed spaces. So I think there's certainly a heightened awareness um, with, with landlords and with occupiers on the importance of those areas kind of post COVID. Um, one of the other things I think that's important is, is when people have been working from home, they've had control over that space. So if you thought you needed fresh air, you opened a window. Um, if you thought you needed more greenery around, then you, you know, ordered some plants or went to the store and bought some. So, so people had more control over that. Whereas in the office, someone else is, is kind of dictating that. So I think in that return, um, I think that's something that that um, that employers and landlords need to be acutely aware of that that understanding what is important to employees, how perhaps that's changed. Um, so some organizations are working at who'd surveyed um, things pre COVID and post COVID have been able to measure um, the importance of some of those areas and how how that shifted and then being able to adapt accordingly. Um, it's not there obviously there are incredible um, systems you can put in place for air quality, but sometimes just putting a few plants around, um, whether or not it actually measurably changes the air quality, it can change people's perception of those things. Um, so again, if, if organizations have the data to understand what where those levels of importance um, and satisfaction are, they can then react accordingly um, to ensure that the employees in those spaces are feeling like um, they're getting what they need. That's great, Simon because uh, I think there's a huge technological constraint when it comes to this. And um, I see this breaking up. Um, we as factory, we've invested in, in a tenant experience app some three years ago called Space OS. Um, because for me, it's all about usability. It's all about how well does this function. And when I then sit down with my engineers to discuss HVAC, I feel like I'm in the 90s again. Building management systems, the way these things are built, it's ridiculous. And most of it is actually, and I hope we're touching on this later, most of this is actually a data peninsula. They're trying to create a lock-in to, to have as much revenue from you as possible, which is the, exactly the opposite of what the real estate industry needs. We need to open up standards and be able to actually exchange data in order to actually improve just as a peninsula, building by building, but as a group. That's just my five cents on that because I'm dealing with it right now and I hate building management systems. Sorry. Okay, no, that's not a problem. So, uh, James, ranking. I was just going to, you know, add add into, I guess, onto those points that it is certainly wellness as a, as a you know, feature of the office space is certainly coming up higher on all the surveys that we're taking part in. Um, but from my perspective, I think there's a big opportunity here because from an economies of scale perspective, you know, a large office space, large office building can provide better air quality, can provide better lighting than most people are going to be able to afford to have in their homes. Um, but I think being able to translate that and show the occupiers that that is the case is, is really important. Um, there's very little, I'd say, on the ground data. I think, Simon, we were talking about this on the intro call, that, that something you do, that you provide, you know, the occupiers of your space a physical way of looking at what is the, the air quality. Um, and there are, you know, there is technology that has allowed that, but it isn't widely adopted. Um, so I think we have to give better visibility of what those benefits are. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so so the sharing and the use of data is definitely something that um, is high up on my agenda. So so let's pick up on that. And I want to go through a few different areas if I can. And the first one, James Pellet, if I can come back to you, was actually just the cultural aspect of people being more and more measured. So we'll come on to what you do with that data in a minute. But we're putting sensors everywhere for air quality or for people, for facial recognition is rising up the agenda. Um, uh, so, so how how culturally do we make sure that occupiers know what we're doing, that we're doing it responsibly, and ultimately we use that data ethically? 
Um, wow, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I, I think the 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 critical factor we have to work out here is that this is these are people's workplaces, and your relationship with your employer is a complicated one. Um, and the reason why I put that background into it is that it's very easy to give people some reassurance and comfort over their space, but it's also very easy for people to feel uh, monitored, tracked, or or snooped upon, and um, and that has a lot to do with um, the management theory, with your theory X or theory Y. Stuff, or you don't trust your staff. And I think if you work, that a culture is untrusting and your boss is always scrutinizing what you're doing you will be very suspicious of any of that technology and so our starting point is always to go as low as we can uh, on that factor we, we don't i am most workplace data is not interested in the individual it is interested in the effect of the group as a whole uh, it is you know any data set that you really need to get some useful ideas upon our understanding utilization over a, say a group of 12 desks rather than one organization is not at all interesting over a group of 12 it's much more interesting so i think you have to set the the threshold very low in terms of personal data but our certain from our perspective we are not capturing any personal data about any of our occupiers in our space but we are understanding it as an organization and giving them feedback as an organization um and I think it's the, it's the points of being very, very careful with that data and, and being very clear about why you're using it and what you're using it for and, and being transparent with the messages that you give back to the employer and, and, and your occupiers and happy to, to share that with anyone. So it's a, it's a minefield for certain, but it's, it's, that minefield is not the reason why you shouldn't walk through it very carefully and, and because occupiers do want the feedback to help make their lives better. That's great. Alison, maybe I could come to you. You've been collecting data on people's wants and desires within buildings and their needs for, for a long time. How, how do you go about getting that balance between measuring everything, which is obviously great to have the data versus not measuring everything so you, you communicate appropriately? Yeah, our survey is, is generally organizations are sending it out to their staff and, and their the communication, the comms around it is the most successful clients who get the highest response rates are, are exactly what James was saying around transparency. They're telling the people why they're collecting the data, what they're going to be doing with it. Um, but with our survey, em employees have the chance to opt in and take it um, or they cannot take it. So that, that gives them a level of choice and control um, as to whether or not they want to participate. Um, in terms of what we then do with the data, um, all of it's anonymized. Anything that goes back to the to the client, you know, the organizations can never drill down to groups with fewer than five people. So all of that is really clearly communicated to people. So they know that neither we nor their employers are going to be able to see on an individual on an individual level what someone's doing. Because again, that's that's not interesting. It doesn't it doesn't actually tell us or the organization what's happening in that organization, how they can make that workplace better, um, which is ultimately what our clients are trying to do. Um, the other kind of crucial area is is around something, you know, around you said we did. Um, so being able to take that data, package it and say, look, we understand X, Y, and Z are the problems. We're, you know, in the next six months, we're working on A, B, and C to address those and keeping employees up to date. So it's about, you know, corporate real estate, working with HR, working with the comms team, working with tech as needed, all of those different different pieces um, and, and making sure that there's a robust communication loop with employees so they understand exactly what the purpose of that is. That's great. James Rankin, maybe I could ask the same to you. I know you, uh, as a business, use an awful lot of data that you collect from your spaces. And I guess this is not just about personal data, but it's about all sorts of data in terms of the building and business performance and so on. So what are your views on how you get that balance right? Um, to mirror James's point, it is very challenging. Um, I think, you know, we've come on, there's a lot of um, technology and sensor-based technology, which, you know, looks at individual desks, which, I think actually was quite expensive 
you know, to, to roll out on large scale, but we're still, we're seeing that develop now with cameras that can sit into the ceiling that will cover off multiple sort of um, multiple locations. And actually that then allows you to look um, at change in movement, which is really the interesting thing um, and utilization of space. Um, I, I would, I think there's a, there's a point of caution in, in around data because it's, it's talked about a lot in the industry at the moment. Um, and we're being asked all sorts of questions around data and, and what can people collect. But I think unless you take a step back and try and think about, you know, what are we going to actually do with this data when we get it? There's, there's a limited, you know, there's limited value or no value really in that data unless you've got a clear plan of how you're going to take it and make changes based on that. So for us, it's all about make, you know, looking at what we call actionable insight and, and making sure that the data that's being collected is part of a wider strategy and there is a change that can come off the back of it, um, which sometimes seems to get forgotten in this sort of rush to get hold of as much as information as possible, um, which we're kind of seeing at the moment. But it, it, it is incredibly important. It is challenging. Um, but there is technology out there that allows you to capture it. Um, the big thing for us is trying to move away from sort of occupancy data to utilization data, but making sure then that the occupiers can use that or the landlords can use that and actually make change based on it to, to, to kind of create continuum uh, improvement. That's great. There's an expression that often gets bandied around about data is the new oil, which is not one that I particularly like. And I think it really encourages that culture of grab on to as much as you can. Of what you can. Uh, which I'm not sure is the right approach. But uh, Simon, maybe I could come to you. Uh, same question, really. How do you get that balance right and, and what sort of data do you collect? Well, um, first off, I mean, it's a panel to usually a boring if there isn't a little bit of disagreement. So I want to disagree a little bit with what I've just heard. Um, I think actually the most valuable data set is from the individual because what we should be using data for is to improve the single person's interaction with the building, the landlord, his employer, but also with the community. And from what we're seeing, um, I think one of the key challenges right now is to main maintain the office as a safe space and as a socializing space, because ultimately that will retain talent. Um, so in, in, let's talk about the uh, work from home reality and let's give it a ballpark 30 to 40% of the uh, workforce being permanently not in the office. That means, what that usually means in the way I see most of our occupiers handling um, occupation levels so far is top down. They're saying, okay, we want these seven people to be in that room at that point in time for two weeks for a sprint. But what's really helpful and what we're seeing is that, um, let's call her Lisa, can see that her three friends are going to be in the office that week and she wants to be there as well. And I think that's actually the main driver for technology in this space. And again, it's what I said before about startups coming bottom up and sort of um, addressing these challenges from a usability perspective. I think that's what we should be focusing on. And the rest comes later. I, I also see the iPhone or the, the phone in general as a major breakthrough component when it comes to collecting data and when it comes to utilizing space. If you look at access control, once we stop using key cards but are using our phone to finally enter the buildings, then you have a different data set. And my target audience, the startups, the tech companies we're working with, um, they are ultimately not as worried about data usage or misuse, be it good or bad. I'm not entirely on that side of the fence. But it is important to be have a target audience that's receptive to the matter of using data and that is working with you in order to improve how you use data. And ultimately, that's why we're doing what we're doing. We think with our clientele and our target audience, we're in a very sweet spot to actually understand how technology will impact the real estate segment um, uh, more. And we're, we're trying. It's trial and error. And thank God our users, are, our, our clientele, our target audience is receptive to it. That's great. And Simon, if I can stick with you, I want to go back to your point about data sharing generally. So collecting data on a building is, is great and it gives you some, some good insights depending on what it is. But the real value is where you get it across the market, you share it, you can benchmark and understand the overall market performance. Um, real estate is enormous, but incredibly fragmented, and we are not particularly good normally at uh, sharing data. So I guess two questions to you. One is, is why should we be sharing data? Because people always want to share everyone else's but not their data. And secondly, what, what needs to happen to really get this sector to move? And then maybe I can come to the rest of the panel for pretty so pretty similar question. Okay, um, also one, good questions. Why I think it's 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 rather simple. If we if we look at the biggest challenges of gentrification and how 
sort of communities are negatively impacted by the real estate industry, which is something we should all be talking about and be aware of. Um, I think the ignorance or the lack of interaction between the different players in the segment is one of the huge problems that we have. So not really knowing what your neighbor is building and why he's building it and who's he interacting with and who's going to be his client, because ultimately it's a competitive arena, is probably one of the reasons why all of these are data peninsulas. If you look at price developments, if you look at um, letting letting data, how much uh, per square foot can I charge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As long as we maintain that as an industry secret and try to optimize individually, I think we're not optimizing for the best of the community and where we actually are doing our work. Um, what needs to change, I think, is 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 the tougher one to to tackle. Um, I think ultimately the incentive, the business incentive of developing stuff. Um, filling it up as quick as possible and then selling it as quick as possible is actually the negative driver in this. And if we manage to find a way in which the community participates, in which gentrification, which I believe it ultimately originally was a positive term, in which sort of landed gentry could help develop things in a better way and, and provide resources to grow a community. If we can get back to that, then that also means the community somehow has to have an upside from all the wealth that's created through real estate. And that's something that we're looking at. We're, we're working heavily with municipalities. We're working with national government. We're trying to sort of create an environment in where serendipity can take place. So we're actively trying to create an environment in where more is being created and not just consumed um, from a business perspective, of course, but also by interacting with the community. And if you pair that with data and success, if you pair that with this is what we did and that's why that worked, then I think ultimately we're improving where we're coming from step by step incrementally, but it would be phenomenal if the real estate industry could embrace that approach a little bit more wide. There's always one who talks whilst you're on mute. So, um, uh, Alison, my apologies, but um, maybe I could come to you. How how do we go about getting the sector level data sharing? And obviously, you already do that to a degree. So a lot of your services about the benchmarking and comparing to other performance. So, so why are we not that good at it? And what needs to happen to make it better? Yeah, I, I mean, we we do share um, our our benchmark. Our our data is all published kind of freely on our website. But that that kind of goes back to our. Um, our organization's kind of values and ethos. And, and Simon had a great point. I mean, it's a, it's a capitalist competitive market. Um, whereas if I think if, if our business had monetized that and done it differently, perhaps our revenue would be a lot higher, but that doesn't kind of fit with what our, our purpose was. Um, I think if you go back to what the purpose of a lot of companies is, shareholder returns. Um, so if they're not maximizing shareholder returns and, and, and that's not their focus, then shareholders get upset. So it, it, it fundamentally is, doesn't work with what our current business model is. So I think there's, there's, uh, as, uh, yeah, to, to a lot of what Simon said, it, it's a, it's a complicated challenge, but I think um, smaller, uh, general, well, they start small, but I think there, there are, there are more grassroots kind of different organizations looking at things differently, trying to disrupt the market and taking a different approach that will ultimately um, change how bigger organizations work because because they will have their hand more or less forced into that. But that's again, kind of a, that's a that's a journey that we're on. And I think we're in the very early stages. Um, but if other organizations can see the value in doing that, um, in kind of pursuing more of a, a, a B corporation kind of approach to business, um, then, then then everybody benefits from it. But it's, it's about getting shareholders to recognize that it's not just about their returns. That's great. great. James Pellet, maybe I could come to you. What's your views on, on the use of data, not just within a building, but at a sector level and that sharing? How do we how do we go about making sure we get those benefits and what needs to happen to make that that change? Still on mute, James. Just please that someone sorry. Else sorry, sorry, sorry. Um I mean, it is a utopian dream, I think, for everyone to share all data, but it, I think it is a question of what you're measuring and, and what's beneficial. I think the arena in which data is most likely to be shared, um, because there is the common purposes around uh, sustainability data and energy consumption and metrics that come from that point, that the investor community is becoming increasingly demanding in what in the granularity of information that we give to them. Uh, which means that 
organizations have to become much more uh, uh, smarter at, at structuring data that's relevant to that point. But I think things that, you know, uh, Simon mentioned his frustration with BMS companies, uh, you know, the, the massive, massive gap in data is in actual terms of performance of components. So in terms of the performance of a particular type of fan core unit or particular type of boiler or whatever else, because the decisions that we need to make as real estate owners are based on much longer whole life carbon decisions. And that data is just not available. You can't make a decision comparing the efficiency of one uh, air handling plant against another piece of air handling plant because either the organizations themselves haven't actually recorded it themselves or they're just as in the central pool. And that I think is, that's, that is critical given how much carbon the real estate sector consumes is if I have one magic wand to, to concentrate on only one piece of data, that would be it. Um, because it's, it's a really uh, useful piece of information that will help us predict maintenance requirements going forward. And James, if I can st stick with putting you on the spot with your magic wand in hand, how would that go about beyond just magic? How, who is it who would bring that together? Because there are lots of conversations about data sets and sharing, and but then where do they go? Who, who, who should be doing that? Um, I think it is uh, people like... Um, Briam, Neighbours UK, the Better Buildings Partnership. It is an industry body of people who who collectively feel that you know membership of that group should be via uh, an element of data sharing within that group. You know, membership should be based on that basis because what you get in, you get out, and that that isn't that's not market data. That's not necessarily sensitive. Uh, data in terms of rents, who's paid what, what yields, what the demand is. That that is that's separate. But from to solve the climate crisis, that's what needs to happen. James Rankin, maybe I could come to you on on either that point generally, but also just the data sharing aspect. Yeah, I mean, I maybe being slightly controversial. I mean, I don't think the change is going to come from the real estate industry itself, or not being forced by it. From my perspective, it's going to be coming from the, the customer or the occupier. Um, and I think what we're seeing in the flexible industry is, is the occupier move into a customer. And what I mean by that is they are working closer with whoever's providing the space for them, um, working in more of a partnership, sharing information. And as we see larger corporates kind of move into this space, um, but also just demand more, in terms of more information across their portfolios. Um, I think the the landlords and the providers of real estate are going to have to start um, to look at providing that information in a more of a standardized way. So I, I think it's going to become you know, customer led rather than necessarily industry led. Um, in terms of who, you know, who provides that, I think it, you know, it does have to be a, a third party, um, someone who is kind of working on a data exchange model. Um, you know, if you look at other industries, in, in most cases, they have data exchange models for looking at various different elements. Where there's a, there's a central body, whether that's for profit or not, um, that is collecting this information and providing it back in a standardised way, both to the providers or the landlords, but also for the occupiers or customers. Um, and I think, unfortunately, you know, the real estate industry hasn't had to adapt to that because it's been in a very you know well-off financial situation for decades, well, centuries. Um, but we're starting, I think, to see that customer-led change. I don't think it's of uh, that those demands you talked about James I think it's slightly different that real estate has forever been mostly been a b2b business and until you accept you're a b2b to c no one's going to manage any data because there's no means of increasing revenue as a result of it and as soon as you accept that you're not going to directly increase revenue but there is a huge a massive benefit in understanding b2b to c then then that would shape your product and that's that's you know, that it took me ages to work out why real estate hadn't invested in this and why it hadn't invested in prop tech as well, generally. But it's because it doesn't really directly increase revenue. And you have, as soon as you accept that point, then uh, your decisions around data become much easier to uh, to make investments and understand. So, so that's a really good point, James. But if I can just stick with that and ask a follow-on question, then Alison, I'll come to you. But um, 
if you look at the energy sector, for example, they are building lots of uh, long term data exchanges. They're experimenting. They're, they're investing in R&D and, and they've got the budgets to do it. Culturally, as a sector, we, we don't tend to invest in R&D and speculative projects. How do we go about getting that change there? Because whether it's not for profit, whether it's, it's centralized, independent or not, as a sector, we need to fund some of these projects and initiatives. Put a big poster screen on the wall of every boardroom member in every real estate company and say, here's the example of what happens when you don't invest in technology and data. Your business will die. It will eventually die. There is no, no question about that. And if you don't understand what that is and you don't understand your data, you're going to die in the end. I'm very much looking forward to look, looking at a lot of boardrooms in the future. Alison, uh, same to you. Um, sorry, I, I had a question for James, if that's all right. Um, back of course. To, <laughs> I know, Dan, that's your role, but I, so you, James, you had mentioned the, that recognition and realization that um, uh, of, of how important that data is, even though it doesn't directly um, contribute to revenue. I'm just curious, how do you get how do you get your peers? How do you get others to 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 turn that light switch on? Um, by listening to Dan. <laughs> um, no, I think I think it it is in this. I I, I genuinely believe that of the only part of the real estate industry that is collaborative and has demonstrated this track record in collaboration is through sustainability. Uh, and it, it is looking at that bigger picture and that focus that I think people will become more comfortable about sharing. The energy data that's being shared is is because it's relevant, right? It's directly relevant to that outcome for everybody, as is sustainability data. There is there is an element of competition about being a more sustainable building than your competitor, which is great. That's that's good. That's um, free market. But I think it is really develop, developing a deep of how buildings actually work relative to utilization that is the key part that we need to understand. Thanks, James. So, so James Rankin, maybe I can come to you. Another question that's come up, which follows on nicely from this, is the importance of sustainability generally. So not just the data specifically, but from an occupier point of view, how important is that becoming? And the question here says, will people will we see people turning down office spaces that aren't sustainable moving forward? So uh, what, what are your views on that? Yeah, I think I think we definitely will, and we're already starting to see those questions sort of be raised at the um, sort of search phase when we're working with our clients. Um, primarily, it's investor-led at the moment. Um, they're the ones that I think are really pushing this this agenda, and therefore it's sort of forcing things down through um, companies themselves. At this point. Um, I can't, I, I'm, I'm not personally seeing it at an employee level. I know it's increasingly important, um, but I'm not seeing it become kind of a, a decision maker um, or not certainly not a primary one. Um, but yeah, I think we're already starting to see it. But there's a big challenge in getting sort of accurate information out um, for companies or for, for customers of, of real estate. Um, we struggle on a regular basis when we're looking at a building for a customer. And we're trying to get sort of you know ESG type type figures out, um, and and we really struggle, particularly if they're sort of taking on smaller chunks of that space. Um, you might be able to get the total building figures, but then to try and get that down by maybe a floor or even a um, you know part of the floor plate is is really still um, very very difficult. I won't say impossible, but but challenging. Okay, Alison. Sorry, James. Alison, what, what are your what are your views from a uh, from an occupying point of view for the, what you're saying? Is, is sustainability becoming more important, or as James suggested, it, do you think it's uh, investor led at the moment? Um, we're not seeing. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think back into the data. I can't recall anything that that indicates um, that in our data. I mean, we ask about um, um, environmental um, importance in, in terms of of the building. I don't, I'm not aware of anything in our data that shows that that's kind of shifted. Um, I, the biggest thing that stands out to me um, in, in that question that we ask um, is, is the neutral. A lot, of, a lot of people come back and say, I don't know if, if this, you know, if, if my workplace kind of how that fits on the sustainability piece. So I think 
for organizations who are prioritizing it, um, I don't know that they're doing a great job communicating it. That's something when we play back our data results that we tell them is always an opportunity if there are things, um, initiatives that they're taking um, to, to reduce their carbon footprint or engage in recycling programs or any of those things. Make sure that, again, that goes back to that comms piece. Make sure it's something that they're speaking out about um, so that employees employees who are, who are switched on and interested in that um, know that that's happening within the organization. Um, but I think it, with, not to generalize, but younger generations, I think are a bit more um, interested in that. So I think it's something that's gonna have to be communicated more um, for as, as more and more of those people um, are into the workforce. That's great. Simon, maybe I could come to you with the same question about sustainability, but also tag on a question you said about earlier about the, the iPhone or the smartphone collecting data. In the next few months, years, whenever it'll be, those people are going to have much more access to data through their phone about things like air quality and, and so on. How do you think that will further impact the, the drive of sustainability needs? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, we're seeing this change on the full spectrum. Um, I, I think if I look at digital transition or transformation and sustainability being the two main drivers in politics, in, in business, everywhere. I mean, our, our planet is becoming uninhabitable. If that isn't a red flag, then I don't know what is. And the real estate industry seems to keep pushing the snooze button and not really pay attention, I have to say. Because um, from the investor's demand or the investor's side, you see ESG as one of the key criteria. ESG is where a lot of the money is going and has to go, and they're struggling to find investment targets if I'm listening to my peers right. If I look at the developers, you have Bream and Lead, which is kind of trying to give it the branded marketing approach of this is good and this is bad. I don't fully agree with it, but it's definitely sort of improving some of the operational models I've seen, some of the development schemes I've seen. But then ultimately, and this is back to the second question, access to data, the iPhone and such, it's about talent. I hear people saying that if this and this coffee shop doesn't have Oatly, then they're not going to go there any longer. And that's a clear demand driven by the client. And I see this breaking through the entire segment. We're seeing it with food right now. We're going to see it in our work culture. And again, coronavirus has only been speeding this up. So I think in the very near future, um, office buildings that cannot deliver on sustainability and some of the amenities, talent works, they're going to run out of clients. James Pellet, what, what are your thoughts on sustainability and how are you approaching that at, at GPE? Uh, it's, it's critical. It's the forefront of our thinking. Uh, it probably drives more. It's, it's the focus of almost everything that we're doing. Uh, so I'll give you a practical example, if I can, that sort of tries to stitch all of this together. Um, the Hickman building is a building we finished last year. It's just achieved the Platinum Smart Score rating. Uh, and it's done that through two things. One is we've created a digital twin of the building so that we are giving, uh, we're monitoring every component within the building. We're monitoring levels of occupancy based against those components. And it's there purely to help close the performance gap between, uh, to, to optimize operational energy so that the EPC A and B ratings are, of, are operating at that point. Uh, and things like Neighbours UK is a really important benefit because any organization corporately is looking at, at, at their building. If they are, particularly if they're in the services sector, that office footprint is pretty much their scope to emission. So if they want to claim to be a net zero carbon business, they're going to have to occupy a building that is a net zero carbon office. And if you don't provide that office, you're not going to get there. Uh, and you only get there if you employ the technology to understand that. And the second point of the, the reason why we got the platinum rating was because we also looked at the user experience. So we've developed our own uh, workplace app, Sesame, that does all of the things like access control. So it's designed really to make the most for, for users of that building before they leave. So on their phone, they can book their desk for the day. They can check the air quality of the building before they leave. They can read magazines on the app before they get there. Uh, once they get there, they can collect a pre-ordered coffee. And once they get at their desk, they can control the heating and lighting uh, re relative to their desk position as well, as well as booking the amenities after it. And we've really thought hard about how we pack all that together because you have to benefit the occupier in terms of sustainable energy, but also for the user to really benefit and make the most of their day. And the two become symbiotic. We did some research along with Alison uh, two years ago. We did some ran some focus groups and we asked people to 
imagine the, the office of 2030 and they all want of all generations all wanted to be working in a, a workplace that was actively trying to tackle climate change and it's there if you ignore it you will it is it is existential you will need to have a clear coherent strategy about sustainability otherwise as simon said you won't attract users if you can't attract users occupiers won't want to sign leases for where you want to be Okay, well, I've got my uh, eye on the clock and I think that's a perfect place to stop. So uh, we're pretty much out of time. So I'm just gonna wrap up by saying thank you very much to all four of you from fantastic insights. Thank you very much for joining. And to everyone watching, uh, we've got a 10 minute networking break now. So please join in the, the networking area and then we'll be back in about 10 minutes at 25 to with the second panel. So Alison, James, Simon and James, thank you very much indeed for joining and uh, speak to you soon. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much for joining the second panel. And uh, just as I start introducing people, I'll ask them to join me on the virtual stage. Uh, and I'm going to be delighted to be joined by Ian Holden, CEO of TSK Group, Salah Lardo, user experience expert from Dries and Sonner, and Taylor Westcote, general partner from Concrete Ventures, and Bogdan Nikora from uh, founder of Bright Spaces. Uh, just before we get into the conversation, just a reminder, Please do post your questions in the Q&A section and I'll introduce those into the conversation as we go. Um, and otherwise, from that, let's let's crack on. So, Ian, good morning. Thank you for joining. Maybe I could start with you, just say a few words about, about you and your company's role. Certainly. Morning, Dan. Morning, everybody. Um, Ian Holden, CEO of the TSK Group. We're a, a, a team of specialists workplace specialists designing and building commercial interiors across the uk and over the past 25 years we've been um, fortunate enough to work with some of the world's biggest brands who have trusted us to make their workplaces better for their people um, perfect thank you very much ian bogdan maybe i could come to you good morning thank you for joining uh, can you just say a bit about you and your organization? Sure. Thanks for having me. I'm actually grateful for uh, sharing the stage with more experienced specialists in, in the workspace because I just joined this industry two years ago when I co-founded uh, Bright Spaces. Uh, and what we are doing is to uh, help landlords, office landlords, better showcase their um, buildings, um, spaces, and connecting that information to um, um, leads and inventory management system. Perfect. Thanks, Bogdan. Sala, good morning. Same question to you. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Dan, thanks. Um, I'm a UX um, designer and a specialist from Trace and Sommer. And uh, Trace and Sommer is a leading European consulting, planning and project management company. Uh, one could say that we would be your partner in planning, construction and operation. And a little bit more about Trace and Summer, we're today about 3,800 experts um, across 46 locations, predominantly in Europe. And as I said, I'm a, I'm a designer and an architect and I, I work in our UX design team. So we are especially focused on user-centric design, of course. And uh, I'm very much intrigued about behavior-focused design, so about behaviors that are needed to make people successful. And creating, of course, the physical, social, and digital touch points that influence those behaviors. So it can be in offices, but it can be anywhere. Any built environment is our field of work. Fantastic, thank you, Sarah. And Taylor, good morning to you. Same question. Um, good to see you, Dan. Um, and thanks for having me on. So Concrete is a, um, a real estate uh, technology advisory and investment business. So we've been <clears throat> helping l large global players like Nuveen, JLL, Starwood, Vinci, um, and others uh, see better into the early stage technology space and understand how um, new capabilities are being created within the real estate sector. Um, and we've made about uh, 18 investments to date. Um, things like Matterport and, and, um, and it, it's, we, we enjoy seeing and helping founders uh, work with real estate companies to create the future of, of the sector. 
That's brilliant. Thanks, Taylor. Taylor, maybe if I could stay with you, just from your perspective, of both working with those companies and the startups, what is what is your perspective of how technology and the use of offices has changed in the last few years? And probably a follow-on question, how's it going to change going forward, especially against the backdrop of COVID? Sure. Um, so uh, I guess there's a few levels, right? So um, at the asset manager level, uh, there's a, there's a, a, a real desire to increase their understanding across an entire portfolio of, of their assets, particularly office. Um, and, and so there, there's a demand for, for data aggregation. Um, at the kind of property and facility management level, um, there, I mean, there's already some just kind of strong players in place with the property management systems like BRD and MRI. Um, we're seeing a lot more happen in facilities managers. So kind of smart building overall, um, it, you know, kind of layers to improve your building performance from an ESG standpoint or, or what have you, wellness. Um, and then down on the, um, uh, so I guess in that level, it would be like BMS stuff. And then down on the kind of uh, the actual occupier, the people that matter, um, greater convenience for them, um, you know, scheduling systems. Uh, most of this is driven by the world of Flex where you have the, the, the WeWorks and, and the like saying the, the the person in the building comes first and getting them what they need, whatever it may be, coffee, beer, uh, um, you know, better cleaning, smarter cleaning, um, you know, gyms, uh, you know, better layouts, all those things. So technology, food, technology lends itself to all of these things in, in to a greater or lesser degree. Um, and so we see change at every level. That's great. And Ian, from your point of view, are you seeing the same thing, the, the rise of technology being used in supporting all of these bits? And I think if I if I paraphrase what Taylor was saying, it's about being much more human focused uh, a lot of the time. Yeah, I think I think before, um, you know, in the in the lead up to the pandemic, I think in the couple of years prior, we'd probably seen three trends from a technology perspective talking to, to, to our clients, um, you know, em employees expectation of technology had changed um, based on the hugely sort of personalized experience that we enjoy in our um, in our world outside of work. So, you know, we sort of started to see new hires rejecting the IT equipment provided by the corporate IT department because uh, they had much better kit and software than, than what was provided. Um, I think the second one was probably the wholesale migration to the to the cloud and the adoption of enterprise software suites such as Office 365. Um, I think that was already facilitating a move towards uh, the work from anywhere um, uh, movement. Um, some For some organizations that was conscious, part of a, an activity-based working model. Um, for others, I don't think they knew what they had until they were forced to use it, which was sort of the, the, you know, the, the, the period from March of last year. Um, and then I think the other one that we noticed was an explosion of sensor technology which picks up on some of the stuff that was in this morning and the first debate this morning i guess um and and i think that in the main that was to to measure utilization or um occupancy rather than any other things like air quality and the the the, the, the sort of um, the extensions of that um but and, I, and i'm not sure many organizations really knew how to um use the data that was generated through that through that process but i think that what's happened um in this last 18 months is that organizations have, have recognized certainly the ones that we're talking to that this represents a huge opportunity you know that the, the learnings of the past 18 months present a, a a way to rethink work and the way that we use buildings um that can benefit the business the people in the business and also the the, the environment that's great, Ian. I, I'm going to come back and pick up on some of those specific points. But Salah, maybe I could come to you on that that aspect as well, especially the yeah. user experience part of it. Exactly, and I could actually first um, add something to Ian. What I've seen in in my work, field of work is that absolutely the tech companies have always been a little bit of ahead of other industries, I would say. But still, I think I'm every time taken by surprise how difficult it is even for the tech companies to adapt, bring your own devices or, or creating compatible systems or user-friendly systems. 
So I can I can see a lot still that people are very happy working for home from home with their own gear, including me probably <laughs> in that. Um, I think something else to in sort of uh, intro is that. Um, I think just before the pandemic started, I think many companies had started to develop, at least I see this in our clients, different kinds of applications and, and user-friendly software for, for the user to, to use space and, and of course to, to navigate and to find different things, whether it's a service or a colleague or, or space. And that was really, of course, uh, sort of like enabled by the cloud and I could see then we were talking a lot I think about already we've been talking a lot about blended space and blending the physical and virtual uh, workspace which of course other companies than tech companies had to sort of adapt to in a very very rapid tempo the past 18, 18 months and I think the gap between the tech companies and, and, and the rest is, is getting smaller. What's interesting is also that there's another sort of like a very strong movement, I would say, is that, that what social media and the impact of social media during the pandemic and how people sort of like, um, how those, how that is introduced into the work and into the office life for creating communities and for bringing people together, sort of like internal social media. What I also think is very, very interesting and what we see a lot at the moment is that we're talking a lot about the hybrid uh, world of work and, and that people are going to in the future work from home and from remotely and in the office, sort of like multiple locations. But I started thinking about this blended uh, blended situation and, and what about, because you also become blended. All of a sudden you are not only virtually connected to people or face-to-face -face connected to people. So you have actually two faces at the same time. You're blended yourself. And this has an impact on your behavior and, of course, really on what, what technology should offer you. So those are sort of, I think, very, very interesting things that are upcoming in the close future once people are starting to work in the hybrid mode. Yeah, certainly how we operate in both the physical and the virtual world at the same time is going to be a, an interesting challenge. So uh, maybe we'll pick up on that again in a bit. Bogdan, maybe can I, I come to you? Just your view on the use of technology in offices generally, um, but obviously specifically with the tenant engagement, leasing, uh, that side of things. How's it changed over the last years and where do you see it going? Sure. Um, when we started this in 2019, we had no idea COVID was coming. So uh, we were just uh, putting a bet on, on, on digitizing the leasing process for commercial real estate. Now we see clearly that um, in the near future, everything will have at least a digital component attached to it. Every part of the uh, real estate process as a whole. But more than that, I would say that uh, we're looking on uh, an uh, upgrade on how on how software is is delivered and used from the captive uh, old school environments to um, uh, digital interconnectivity between everything. Um, so just to follow up on on the last discussion in the previous panel, yes, I, I, I truly believe that data will be shared more than it has uh, until uh, now. And um, also that um, different kind of companies in different areas of, uh, of the real estate will start collaborating to bring um, like holistic solutions in, in, into, the, in, into the playground. And I think we already see these kind of things happening through uh, m as or even um, just um, worldwide collaboration between, I don't know, like, uh, Matterport and Cushman or um, uh, HQO and, and uh, uh, other other companies uh, just by trying to bring the best solution to uh, their existing uh, com companies, clients. Okay, that's great. So we, we've covered a lot of different points there and, and if I can pick up on a few from the earlier panel as well, an awful lot of this comes down to the culture of the property sector and our ability to embrace technology, adapt and move so I just wanted to, uh, Bogdan, if I can stick with you, uh, just explore how that cultural aspect is at the moment and, and how it needs to change, if at all, moving forward. Uh, for example, certainly leasing remotely and not visiting buildings was something that was absolutely a no-no from 
a lot of the people I've spoken to until lockdown. And then people realized it was actually a pretty good way of saving time and money. But um, what, what are your views on the cultural aspect of real estate and particularly engaging with technology? Well, I think um, as in any other uh, case, we're talking about business here. And as, as long as everyone will understand that the tech layer will bring benefits to all players and will not necessarily disrupt someone or some part of the industry, I think uh, they will all start uh, adopting. So, uh, for example, um, the digital leasing uh, solutions uh, like Brightspaces are not aiming of fully digitizing the entire leasing process because it will still require a lot of uh, human interaction, especially for big companies for longer leases and for uh, um, um, companies that need more than one offices. Uh, however, for uh, smaller offices, it's it's now obvious that you can um, uh, lease um, for a short period of time an um, office for um, up to 10 people on online by just viewing a virtual tour, all the amenities, uh, the location on an interactive map and so on. So um, I think from that, um, I'm not sure if this is just like a cultural thing, but more like a traditional, like we were used to doing things in a certain way. Um, before COVID, we saw a lot of landlords actually um, wanting to, to keep things as they were. And now um, after this happened, we are seeing a lot of them um, trying, experimenting uh, this kind of virtual touring, um, virtual interactions on a virtual tour like chat or um, yeah. live conversation with, with potential tenants um, as a part of their process. So we are not seeing this as a, a going full, full, full digital for the leasing process, but we are seeing it as a more and more important part of the leasing process. That's great. Ian, what are your experiences of the culture of real estate generally, uh, especially landlords, I guess, in terms of adopting technology? And has that has that changed in the last 18 months or so? Uh, I think for sure it's changed, uh, but it was changing prior, I think. I think that the, um, the, 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 the move to quality buildings and um, landlords recognising that, uh, you know, referring to uh, tenants as clients rather than uh, uh, the, the the historic sort of language um, was happening before before all of this um, and, I, and I think that will only be accelerated I think that this um, uh, that the there has been a huge amount of learning through this process um, and I, I the 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 behavioral piece will be interesting which is what we're referring to in terms of um, you know people reverting to previous behaviors but i do think that the landlords generally are um in better alignment with uh, the, the their occupiers because suddenly the 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 individual visiting the building is 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 important to both if that makes sense yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Salah, yeah. uh, what are your views on the cultural aspects of engaging with technology and, and have the, how that's changed and what needs to happen, if, if anything? Yeah, I, absolutely. I wanted to just add to that. that you know, we, we've been talking uh, for the past 10 years about the war for talent. And if you now really think about it, so it's you complement it with war for tenant. And the landlord really needs to sort of um, think about the two in order to become very successful. And you can see that tenant organizations, and, and especially because if the focus is in the end user, and the end user demands for technologies, sort of expanding and bringing your own also to any building. So I would imagine that the landlords need to sort of find a sustainable and, and, um, and a robust solution, how they can sort of improve, or is it enhance or a, yeah, improve their portfolios? also with technical uh, solutions serving the That's great. organizations. And Taylor, maybe if I could come to you, I know you've worked in uh, a number of different sectors. How do you find the culture of real estate in terms of embracing technology generally? Has it changed in the last few, uh, few months or 18 months? And where do you think that'll be going in the future? You're on mute, Taylor. 
to work with uh, really some some world leading and kind of leading thinking brands in the space. Um, so they're already into technology before all this. One, um, I guess I'll, I'll highlight uh, a, a few changes. Um, so one, a bunch of the people that were maybe less interested before are now more interested and we're 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 getting approaches from a, a wider range of, of companies that are realizing actually we can do something about it two for the people we were working with where previously um it was kind of a make hay while the sun shines situation there is a rush for data right we need to understand our portfolio better both on a like no normal performance basis but dramatically around ESG. So that's exploding. Um, so companies like Measurable that in our portfolio that that um, that that track ESG for Gresb and, and so on and so forth um, are seeing a lot more business. Um, Matterport also like massive increase in business from the remote side. And then third, um, you know, uh, to, to Bogdan and, and Ian's points around um, the customer it's 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 the person that is supposed to be in the building that makes the decision to pay the money and it's what they want that matters and so real estate companies are like any other business they 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 go where the customers are they do what the customers want we'll see an office um don't need to necessarily be in the office so much as you know again um, a flight to quality. So we'll see the high quality buildings do well for the, the companies that want to have a headquarters, a smaller headquarters. They'll probably want a bunch of passes to go to, to let their employees go to different co-working sites. Um, and, and they'll want that at um, multiple size floor plate sizes, right? So 10,000 square feet and 100,000 square feet, fine. Um, but when you drop below 10,000, we're kind of sub five, Historically, you were see people, seeing people going to the, the flex operators. Um, we're starting to see a trend of, no, we need our culture. So below, once you hit 50 people, like you're sick of WeWork, right? You need your own environment. But that's only a three to five square foot, uh, three to five, three to seven K square foot floor plate. You know, your big brokers aren't gonna be doing that. Landlords, uh, you know, it, it's not efficient to, to do build out for, um, 3,000 square foot floor plate uh, for a two to three year lease, right? The, the, um, the payout there is a little weird. So we're seeing companies like kit offices really get traction where they help smaller clients um, figure out what they need, use a heavily digitally enabled process around acquisition, um, you know, des design and fit out, um, uh, and then front and back of house management. So you get your culture, you get your central location. It's not a WeWork. Um, you're only in a two to three year lease. Um, and uh, you, you don't have to like source property managers and all that stuff happens digitally, which is really nice. Mm. Yeah, that's great. So Tony, maybe I could just stick with you for a minute. There are two questions that have come in from the audience and uh, I'm gonna try and combine them a little bit because they're, uh, they're slightly different, but along the same theme. And it's about the volume of technology out there. So let's assume that everyone's happy to engage with technology. They want to use it. The question is, where do you start? There's a huge amount. So what's the approach that you should take? Do you go for one app or do you go for lots of customized ones? Up with all of this, because it's it's a bit of a minefield and it's, it's a bit bewildering at times. So Taylor, maybe I could start with you and then we could go around the others with the same question. So, uh since so this is should landlords look for one piece of tech is that the one that you're asking about right so um there's lots of tech in a building i, I assume you're referring to tenant engagement the world of tenant engagement is that correct because you could be asking about a smart bms but that's a totally different thing well i think it's probably just a, a broader question about what's the best approach to take there's a huge amount of technology out there how do you find out who to use for yeah. whatever purposes it's yeah. whether it's bms or tenant yeah. engagement um do yeah. you go for so, lots of small bits or one yeah um so first of all um it's not about tech right it's about understanding the problem what is it you're trying to address tech's not always the answer so so don't get any tech until you're very clear about what problem you're trying to address 
and, and what are the options for ways to address that, right? If you're trying to make people happier in your building, if you're trying to better understand what's, what's going on in your building, if you're trying to make your building more efficient, um, tech is not the automatic answer. So it's one of the answers. It's probably a very good one and eventually you'll want to use it. Um, but if you don't understand your problem space well, and you just throw some tech at it, you're going to be disappointed. Um, and so it's not one answer for everyone. It's different answers for different people. It depends on the building size. It depends. So when we when we do research report around the future of the retail operator, um, uh, it's not one size fits all. When we then dive in and do a specific asset analysis for one of our partners, like a particular multi-use building in Madrid, let's say, um, the answers for tenant engagement, parking, um, you know, hotelizing, um, you know, uh, flex retail, all those answers are different with different um, solutions for that particular building than let's say, you know, the Piccadilly train station that's gonna be built in Manchester, right? They're totally different. Um, so yeah. there's no one answer, but you gotta understand your problems first. And you're probably gonna want your data before you before you just hand it over to someone else as a to give you a solution. I was just yeah. going to come in on that if, if I could follow up to, to agree wholeheartedly with the, the, the point about, you know, the, first of all, understand what, what it is that you're trying to, um, what, what outcome you're looking for before you before you get into the tech for sure. I think there's a lot of, a, a lot of our work is with occupiers um, as well as landlords. Uh, and I think there's a huge sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, tendency to follow fashion i think the whole sort of sensor technology thing for a start for a lot of these organizations was about doing what the other people were doing i can remember a conversation with a, a, a um, property director of a global insurance company and he, he took us they'd rolled out sensor tech across all of their portfolio worldwide and he basically said you know, be careful what you wish for we've got more more data than we know what to do with yeah and and if you haven't defined that that to uh, that you know what what are you deploying the technology for beforehand then it, you, you be dis be prepared to be disappointed i think i think that that whole thing that says what is it that we are uh, what is it that our people need what is it that the business needs and ultimately then look at ways to get um, uh, you know ways that technology can help to make that easier yep can i add i would totally agree because exactly in a similar way, like when we are uh, sort of like researching or investigating or or sort of like co-exploring with our uh, user organizations, like what what kind of physical space they need, it's exactly the same. What kind of a virtual space they need, and that would probably apply to the landlord scope totally, like Taylor said, that you know, find out first why, a answer first the why question and what question, and then start to think. What, what is the solution? What is the best or optimal solution? Because the tech, technological solution is there. And if I look at, for instance, our, our clients and our client organizations, they have very different solutions because they, they have different kinds of needs in, yeah, in different sorry. buildings. Yeah. Well, well, Dan, what are your views on, on the approach to technology that people should take Look at those questions? I will be uh, assuming after all, all of uh, the three panelists that uh, the, um, the buyer already has the problem and knows that they want the software so that I can answer the question. And I would say that, first of all, um, I would stay away from, from, from purely customized solution because uh, the world of software as a service is now growing. And uh, just imagine what what a SaaS company is actually looking at, creating the best possible uh, solution and getting um, the monthly or yearly revenue from that solution for many years to come. Whereas a custom software developer will look to develop your solution right away and then probably switch to the next, uh, to the next project. So I would say that SaaS solutions are better than fully customized solution, obviously personalized SaaS solution, and also very with very uh, high degree of uh, integrating with other uh, solutions so that you cover the data problem so that you don't have a lot of islands when it comes to your tech stack but you have an entire continent working together to bring the best uh, 
um, the best benefits for your company, depending on the on the digital solution that you're using. Okay, that makes sense. So I want to come back to data in, in two seconds. But before I do, Bogdan, if I can stick with you, all this technology is great. Your answer about start with the problem and then work through. How do you go about measuring the return on investment? Because often it's not as though it's something that's been there for a long time that you can measure looking backwards, which is the traditional real estate way. How do you test out and work out the value of technology and the use of it moving forward? I think that for um, purely data-driven solution that is kind of easy, you connect them to the KPIs that you have in your company and maybe you can actually measure them. However, I see that there are two trends right now uh, in, in prop tech. Uh, there are a lot of solutions out there trying to just cover the bits and pieces of, of, of the digital environment for the real estate that was just like kept outside of, of, of real estate for, for the last years by landlords, by brokers. They just wanted things to be the way they were in, in the past. And right now there are a lot of solutions that just cover without like combining this uh, to a, a, a KPI. It's like the best practice. You, do you or do you, or you do you need like virtual tours for your spaces or not? Probably in, if you think about how things will be in five to 10 years, everyone will wor be working with this. So uh, I think depending on the stage that the company is, uh, is right now, you should look if you are um, like at zero and you need to just start using experimenting with technology and start figuring out what you need and how to measure that. Or if you're more advanced, you should definitely um, opt and use the solutions that can provide um, instant or very, very fast return on investment. That's great. And maybe I could come to you. You will both use technology and also advise your clients who are using them. How, how do you go about measuring the value of that technology that you're using? I think it's very difficult, uh, particularly um, to, to have a to, to to be able to pin a tangible return on investment to some of these things that we're deploying. Particularly as we return to workplaces after a period where they've been empty, and maybe some of this technology has been has been deployed. I think my view would be, um, you know, if if the technology is helping you to make decisions that improve your business performance and your employee experience. I think that's a reasonable uh, KPI to start to judge, you know, uh, whether that is um, uh, a worthwhile investment, uh, a worthwhile return on investment. Add to that a little bit is that I, I also feel that it's extremely important to sort of very clearly define why you are measuring. You can also measure in order to improve the future situation. So that you have a future direction, whether it's for your real estate or for your your techni technology solutions. So I think that that's that's very very important to start with. And and the other thing I could say is that what I advise also our clients to do is that put those measuring uh, mechanism into place now, so that don't wait for the workforce to come back and then start thinking. Oh, maybe we should measure. Have we succeeded, or you know, do we have enough, or is it, should it be something totally different? If it, if it's true, like everybody says, that the office of the future is completely a different kind of place, so start thinking about measuring it now. Yeah, I, I would echo Ian's comment. It's really hard. So when we work with our partners that say we want some version of a smart building, uh, whether it's retail, office, uh, you know, logistics. The, the 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 lead in business case is 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 scant right it's we need to look at this because we know people are asking for it real estate is measured in actually fairly um uh simplistic terms right like um what's the rent what's the operating cost um and 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 did and, and then i guess building or did someone take the lease and 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 the the analysis of why or why not is pretty difficult, and so they're mostly driven by um, expectation of impacting these this small number of 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 very meaningful events that happen in the sector. So, you know, tenant engagement, like what's the business case for that? Haven't seen anybody say it. 
uh, or, or defend it with statistics. But I have heard people say, if you take the thing away, your tenants flip out, right? Um, so, okay, well, we have to have it there, clearly. Um, how do we how do we manage that kind of drag on our NOI when it comes to selling the building? Don't know yet, um, but clearly it's very important and we'll figure it out over time. That's great. To come back, every time just to come back in there, Dan, just to, 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 to follow up on the point I was making about the insurance company with the, the, um, the inundated with data. There was a good example of where their um, their their measure or their um, business need was was very clear. It was a consolidation of um, two offices in most cities into one, and the deployment of of sensor technology was to facilitate the the utilization across that piece. They were able to 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 justify that demonst uh, that investment in technology on the basis that it saved them millions and millions of dollars across the, the across the world in real estate but it was one measure it didn't it, it wasn't it didn't actually explain whether it improved the user experience i would hazard that it didn't but but they were as far as that individual was concerned there was a tangible return on investment for that that was um, quantifiable because they were really clear on what they went into it for okay that's great so so Bogdan yeah yeah sorry I, I just uh, was inspired by Yen and, and remember something that uh, I have an example for 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 how Brightspace has brought some some uh, very clear uh, advantages but it's not that measurable but so for example we are the first point of contact for for the landlord uh, and um, the leasing specialist came to us uh, from from one of our clients and told us it's so great that I, I had a client today coming and uh, I wanted to pitch them the way I was used to do it. And they said, yeah, we know all of this. We know everything about the building. Let's just get down to business to discuss the business case and uh, the, the numbers. And it was the first time they were able to see this kind of uh, engagement with a potential tenant because uh, before having a digital layer, uh, you were just supposed to get on with the the, the blah blah and, and to explain everything. And this, I don't think this is something that you can measure right away, but this is something that is obviously uh, something that you need to to have in your organization as a landlord. Okay, that's great. So something that's come up in all of these points is about data. So I wanted to just pick on data for the last 10 or so minutes that we've got. And maybe look at it in two different ways. The first one is to avoid Ian's point of uh, the example earlier of just how do you collect data on everything? So what's the best way of going about it? Uh, and then maybe we'll come on to it at a sector level, but just from an individual company's point of view and Bogdan, maybe I could stick with you. How would a company go or a building go about measuring data, but making sure that they don't drown in huge volumes of data that they can't use? Yeah, this is a very good question, uh, and I I have to to answer that uh, sincerely. I believe everyone is still experimenting with this. Those the same way we are now not aware of how the office of the future will look like. We have a lot of ideas on that. The same way we don't know exactly what will be the right uh, data to be measured measured and how we are we have the obvious part. But um, for example, all of the, the new prop techs regarding the coming back to work, right? They are measuring everything, um, uh, which person is at which, oh, but it, that will uh, be obsolete if the, the way people are really working will change in, in six months or in one year. So I believe uh, we should experiment a lot on this. We should gather as much data as we can, um, but not go into the, the, the uh, GDPR problem or uh, any kind of um, uh, individual uh, sensitive data, but we should we should gather as much data as possible, and we should, as as I said said earlier, I think uh, we should work together in different kind of areas in order to see how we can leverage this data for better results for the landlords. Okay, that's great, Salah. We should get as much as we can possibly get. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah, we are we are looking with one one interesting thing is that with one one of our client companies, a tech organ tech company, that could we because we've changed everything, so 
whether it's the it's the physical in environment, but also the the whole tech in tech environment, service environment. So that could be just put into a simple rating mechanism in place because we are all, all are used to rate everything. We are rated and we are rating every day. Like whatever you do nowadays, you get this little questionnaire. Can you please give a rate? So, you know. So we are we are just looking in, into it. That could, could you get sort of like more qualitative data around like I like I dislike level about the changes and that could be applied of course to to the technology solutions as well that's great uh in sorry sorry not done yeah uh, sorry just 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 uh something uh i, I believe uh that the the one most important thing that we should measure is is usage right now as as taylor said uh with his example um, we should use on if, if, if people are actually using that and, and how they are using that in, in the case of uh, tenant occupancy apps, uh, I think we can, we can understand better what can be done in the future with the tech stack and with the, the services that the landlord offer, offers. I absolutely I'll come back to agree. On that in a second. Absolutely. So, so Ian, how do we go about your clients not being in the situation of just having so much data they don't know what to do with it? Um, I think I don't. I don't know. I'm best placed to um, comment on how they collect the data. Not necessarily in my area of specialism, but I, but I go back to my point originally that sort of says, well, you know what. And ultimately that then, if it is improving the building performance, the business performance or the user experience, then then ultimately I think that that, that you can make better choices about how to collect data. Um, I think Salah's point about regular user feedback is is that's that the, the, the best organizations that that I've witnessed up close have a um, a continual communication loop that that is uh, that is um informing the next you know the, the decisions in a, a real in real time almost yeah absolutely okay so taylor um a couple of points that came up there so i'm going to come to you on on two points so one is uh earlier on you said about the re real driving esg data that people are looking for how do you correlate that and make sure you collect that data and correlate it with those three or four points that you said earlier, which you're absolutely right, is the key drivers of property, whether it's a deal's happened or rent or, or so on. How, how do companies go across um, bringing those bits together? I guess within the context of not just collecting everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so on ESG, there's two ways. Uh, either you just outsource it all to a consulting company and pay a lot of money for them to gather that data, or you have ESG people internally and you use a platform like Measurable to collect that data. And then you kind of benchmarking against the sector for the age, use type, and, and, and size of building. Um, so when you gather that data uh, benchmarked, with under, then you, you know, figure out what to do about it. Let's say we put LED lights in or um, put smart PIR sensors in the conference rooms or add a add a, a you know a, a layer of, of of smart BMS over and above your your Siemens platform. Um, so there's a bunch of things you might do there. Um, uh, you know when it gets into if you're talking about how does that drive um, making users happy, you you can share that data with them. It's important to them. Um, probably depending on your your occupier or customer um uh but that i mean the, the collecting it's the easy part um uh, i i wouldn't say collect as much data as you can you got to figure out why you're going to use it right because you want to be able to sell better those are the building documents you got twenty thousand documents per building at time of sale all the surveys and all that stuff um you need to have that organized you need to do something like architrave for that um, you know, you have a good property management system. Everybody has a property management system. You know, to Salah's point, the, uh, and I'll say, like, honestly, um, I'm kind of perplexed. James uh, Cipolla from Blackstone got up on stage two years ago and said, if you have data about how users, uh, your occupiers feel about being, being in your building consistently over several years, we'll just pay you more for your building. It's that simple. 
and I don't see anybody selling that product yet. Uh, I'm shocked. Um, uh, I don't hear anybody marketing that uh, capability. There are thousands of tenant engagement apps out there that should be doing that, um, and yet it's not sort of sunk in yet, which is strange. So we'll see that happen, I'm sure. Um, and so it's, you know, what's my NOI? Uh, and can I make my rent higher? You know, to make rent higher, you need good industry benchmarking. Um, and so you need to know how your building is performing on the ESG standpoint and how other buildings are performing on an ESG standpoint. You can't live in a bubble with that. Um, that I don't know if that gets at, you know, ESG is, yeah. is so all encompassing um, that uh, hopefully that gets at a little bit of what you're asking. Yeah, no, that's perfect. So, so Salah, maybe I can come to you. We, we've heard a lot about data, data sharing, benchmarking. Um, it's very difficult to benchmark with either without either a huge proportion of the market, so you've got huge amounts of data yourself, or with the market sharing it. And real estate does have some really good examples of where that happens, but on the whole, it's not something we're traditionally that good at. So, what are your thoughts on how? What needs to happen and, and how do we share more data so we can allow that benchmarking that the Taylor was talking about? Salah, I think you're on mute. Salah, I think you've just frozen for a second, so I'm going to come to Bogdan with the same question if I can, and then I'll come back to you afterwards. Bogdan, how do we get the sector to share more data so we can allow the comparisons and the benchmarking? Um, first of all, we have the startup layers. So startups should see each other um, also as, as uh, collaborators not, not, and not just as competitors. This is the the first thing and we we already started discussing with a lot of startups to uh, share data and to share uh, objectives with them in order to bring a better solution on the market and secondly from the landlords and brokers perspective uh, it's just about the mentality shift so it's just like looking at the future and seeing that in the future uh, in 10 years, uh, the data will be out there. It's just a matter, are you going to be one of the first sharing and also uh, getting the, the, the best results out, out of this um, market data sharing, or are you going to be a laggard in, in, in this play? And I think um, US is, is better at this than, than us right now, if we are to look at how the data is shared there. Um, but I think this is also because of the way uh, Europe is built, like different cultures, different languages, and we still have a lot of things to to solve. But I would say that it's it's a mentality shift. That's great, Sala. Yeah, yeah. So I, I wanted to go back to actually what I said earlier, or what we talked about earlier. So it's you know when you collect data for for changing, for for sort of like defining the future direction. So, of course, in an ideal world, if you have data already collected before the change happened, what well, in many companies can take place. So before you change something, you collect first sort of data. And then, then after you've made the change, you collect the data again. And then, of course, it shows you, have you succeeded in the change or do you need to change it or, or, or change it into another direction? So I'm not so big fan of benchmarking everything I think that because every like coming more from the user organization so if you really think um, all the organizations are are different and like we all already said I think Ian said that yeah there is no one size fits all and no one solution we've got multiple solutions so every company should actually uh, collect the data for themselves and benchmark it against to what did they have and what what do they want to have and which way should they go does that make sense yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions that have come in from the audience, which I'm, I'm keen to pick up on. We've got a, uh, just one or two minutes left, so I'm going to throw it to the floor and see if anyone wants to pick up the, the mantle. Um, what is a smart building? Any Anyone wants to have a go at the definition of a smart building? We've written all research report about this, which you can download on our website. Um, uh, a smart building is a building that 
um, talks to you and um, helps you understand how to make it work better. As simplest like way I could put it. I think that's a, a pretty we, good definition. Yeah. We define also smart buildings through that, you know, the, they can significantly reduce the workload of asset management and property management and facility management, of course, then without the end user being involved. And, that's great. Okay. Um, there's a question here which I don't fully understand, but I, I can have a go at answering it if, if no one else wants to. But is there a clear winner in the properties operating system of choice now? Has Microsoft BI won the battle? Any views on that? I, I, I don't know. I mean, BI uh, is a visualization tool. I don't know that it's a property operating system. I, wouldn't, no, I, I, would I, I don't know that I'd call it that. No, I tend to agree, and I think it's certainly it's certainly got a lot of domination in terms of data analysis and visualization. But there are lots of other really good tools out there as well that are, are getting lots of traction. Uh, and then the the final question is: um, Is the ability, the technology within a building, becoming more important than its location? And that's maybe I can go around and ask for a very quick answer from from everyone. Taylor, you're shaking your head. Nope, nope. Real estate still location. Sala? I would say that it depends on the organization. I, <laughs> it can be either or. Fantastic. Well done. I would say that for the uh, well-located buildings, it, this is definitely not the case. But for uh, buildings which are located in uh, not so fortunate areas, tech might be something helping a lot in the leasing process. That's great. And Ian, last word to you. Yeah, I think I agree that location is still going to be a, a massive factor, um, but the uh, the technology will be the differentiator in those major, in those great locations. Okay, fantastic. So I think we're pretty much out of time. So I'm going to wrap it up there and just stop, um, just finish by saying thank you very much to all four of you for joining. Really fascinating insights. Uh, thank thank you. you to everyone for um, for joining the conversation and watching in. Uh, the networking area is going to be open for another 15 minutes or so, so please hang around and uh, network. I'm just going to finish by saying finally thank you to the sponsors, Malcolm and Dries and Summer, uh, for enabling this session. So thank you very much for joining us and hope to speak to you soon. Thanks, everyone.